you're so far away. <laughs> so a phone, a phone will work just fine. Some way for you to write down something so we can do this exercise together. It's going to take uh, three or four minutes. If you opt out of it and decide, oh, no, no, I don't really need to do this. I'm just going to politely listen like I normally do in church. Um, then the next three or four minutes are going to suck and be unrewarding. So up to you. Now, what I want you to do first is uh, give yourself a little header that says, uh, God, I'm thankful for dot, dot, dot. Um, if, you, if you're curious or nerdy, the dot, dot, dot is referred to as an ellipses, and there's only three. Don't mess that up. The Lord will know. Um, God, I'm thankful for. And then I want you to think, uh, first of all, of, of a person in your life for whom you are exceedingly grateful that is not in your immediate family. This gets everybody off the hook from having to write the name of their spouse next to whom they are sitting. Uh, but no, somebody in your life that you're thankful for. It could be a, like a sports coach. could be a friend at work. I mean, it could, could be anybody. Just somebody that, that you're really glad you've got. And then I want you to write one thing, one simple pleasure for which you're grateful. Uh, mine this last week was the two giant bags of kettle corn from my friends Glenn and Dana who brought it to church last week, which... Oh, that, we knew the Lord was alive then. That was spectacular. Uh, could be anything. Could be ice cream twice in one day. Could be a chance to play guitar, whatever. Just something you're thankful for. And third, I want you to write down um, an, an opportunity that you've got that allows you to do something you're good at. Uh, maybe you're a great golfer and you get a chance to play golf this week. Great. Uh, maybe you love your job, you're uh, an exceptional architect, and that's the field in which you work. Fantastic, great. Just s some opportunity for you to exercise mastery, to feel good about yourself, to feel like you're winning in some area of your life. Now, these, these gratitudes, of course, are a kind of prayer. Uh, but more significant than that they are prayer is the fact that this is an appropriate way to begin praying. When we start with thanksgiving, with gratitude, it, it immediately changes our perspective. Because usually the things that drive us to prayer are our dissatisfactions, our fears, our anxieties, our, our, our concern, our, our sense that, that if we don't get God's help now, we're, we're trub in trouble. And if we begin with gratitude, what it, what it forces us to do is acknowledge that God is already giving us good things. God is already putting people and places and situations around us to benefit us, to bless us, to create for us a kind of cocoon of his providence and blessing. And most of us, most of the time, miss that and miss it to our detriment. So when we pray, well, let's begin with thanksgiving. Now the next headline I want you to write is I want you to write, Lord, please provide assistance for... Dot, dot, dot. Ellipses. And here we're going to think of three people. Because it's appropriate to pray for others. And in fact, before we ever get to our requests, which again, are usually the things that drive us to pray, uh, let's start by praying for the people around us. And so first I want you to think of somebody in your life uh, that, that needs hope. Somebody that's at the end of their rope. They've they're despairing, they're depressed, they feel like they've got no options, they've got nowhere to turn, they feel like they're done. I want you to write their name down. Lord, please provide assistance for David, Jonathan, Susan, whoever. And secondarily, I'd like you to write down the name of somebody that you know that needs help. That help could be financial assistance. It could be, uh, you know, getting connected to a, a skilled therapist. It could be help with an exam that they're studying. Whatever. Maybe they're overloaded. Maybe they have seven kids. If we know someone like that, we're all writing their name down <laughs> over and over and over again. Uh, somebody that needs help. And lastly, I want you to write down the name of somebody who needs healing. Now, I'm a great believer in the supernatural. I believe that sometimes God does, in fact, supersede the laws that God himself put in place. He performs miracles, not as often as we would like or as we might think, but he does do that. So maybe you've got somebody in your life that, that needs 
honest to God, supernatural, Holy Ghost, Holy Smoke kind of healing, great, pray for them. Maybe somebody's struggling with cancer. Maybe they have a rare condition, whatever. But maybe there's somebody in your life who needs a different kind of healing. Uh, Maybe an an emotional healing. Uh, An intellectual healing. A healing of their spirit. Many things happen to us over the course of our lives, and and we don't quickly recover from them. And so two years later, five years later, those those old wounds, man, they're, they're festering. They stink. They're gross. They're just wrecking everything in our lives. Well, I, I want you to think of somebody like that, somebody that, that you can hold up to God. Now, the reason I want you to write these prayers down, I want, I want you to write these down, I, I, I want you to, to see, just quickly on your screen, on your piece of paper, I just, I just want you to see what God is already up to around you and through you. We often feel alone and disconnected, like our prayers don't really matter, like our relationship with God's not really happening. But, but in four minutes, you get a sense that already, man, you're an agent of God's plan to heal the world, cooperating with His Holy Spirit to bless, to heal, to provide hope and help to those around you. And already, God, God is blessing you. He's renewing you. He's restoring you, even with simple pleasures like kettle corn and double ice cream. And when we go to prayer and follow some simple disciplines, we, we begin to realize, man, that, well, that, that prayer isn't even the starting point for our relationship with God. Prayer is how we wake up to God. Prayer is how we deepen our awareness of God. Prayer is how we take the next step and the next step and the next step. So we pray for all the things that God's already doing. We pray for the other people around us. And then, of course, we want to know, am I now allowed to pray for me. Yeah, sure, of course. Of course you are, of course. I asked my mom once, I was maybe seven or eight years old, I said, Mom, I know that you've always taught me to pray for others, but is it ever okay just to pray for me, like that good things would happen? No, absolutely not, she said. <laughs> now, fortunately, my mom has since matured. She's a much better Christian now. She had some great teaching. Um, uh, but, but the truth is, you, you, you can Pray for yourself. Uh, but that, that really brings us to the substance of tonight's teaching. Is if you can pray for yourself, and if, and if it's okay to ask for things. And if we believe that God does, in fact, still perform miracles, and he works on our behalf, and he works through us, and he works for us, how, how come it doesn't always work? Like, like, how come we pray for stuff, and nothing happens? How can we feel like God is uncaring, impassive, impotent, asleep at the wheel. And so what I want to do tonight is is talk about the chief cause of unanswered prayer. And we're going to begin by looking at a scripture here. Um, You're about to pray for healing for when I plummet to my death, just carefully stepping over these. Um, uh, But let's look at this scripture here in in, uh, Matthew chapter 7, really common piece of the Bible where Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Notice he, he's not quibbling here. Ask and it might be given to you. Ask and if you're good. <laughs> Ask and I'll talk to your mother. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Uh, for everyone, everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Well, I think if we're honest, which we're not usually, especially about religion, especially about our secret opinions concerning Jesus and his teaching. But if for one moment we can kind of cut the BS, if we're honest, it feels like Jesus is lying or wrong. Because we've asked and not received. And we knocked, and ain't nobody opening the door. And all that patronizing nonsense about God closing a door so he can open a window just doesn't wash, man. It just doesn't wash. So we want to know, why doesn't God answer our prayers, especially when our prayers are good? This here for me, whew, praise Jesus. 
This here for me is a symbol of unanswered prayer. Anybody know what this is? It's a, it's a climbing axe. Um, I, I don't climb. Normally, I think you're supposed to have two. That, that might be why my prayers go unanswered. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I use this as my, as my river tool when I go scuba diving, and there's a current. And, and of course, uh, you know, when you're underwater, you're, you're very movable. It doesn't matter if you're 230 pounds, because underwater you float, and you can go away, and a, t- a two-mile-an-hour current can take you very, very far off course very, very quickly. Um, and some friends and I, a couple years ago, we were going to go to the St. Clair River. Do you know where that is? Everybody? I feel like everybody in Michigan knows where everything else in Michigan is, but there's this river, the St. Clair River. Um, and it's really not very wide, and it's really not terribly deep, but it's a very important river for commerce um, and, and especially for shipping lanes. Uh, so it's maybe uh, as wide as a football field. I mean, that, that's pretty generous. And we have a friend who's got a, a property r- right on the St. Clair River, and so we go scuba diving right out, uh, off his front door, so to speak. Um, and, and because they've been using the shipping lane for hundreds of years, sometimes you can find really cool stuff on the bottom of the river. Uh, because the river's only like 50 feet deep. Sometimes you can find old bottles, souvenirs, watches. He's found all kinds of weird stuff, signs that have you know, fallen overboard as, as old transport ships have come through. So you, you always go with sort of this excitement that maybe... Today is the day I sell something on eBay <laughs> and you know, pay off my children's future student loans, you know. So I'd never been out there before. My friend said, you need to go buy something to dig into the ground because the current's so bad, um, you'll get sucked off the bottom, and then, you know, you can't, the visibility's not any good. So I thought, well, okay, I'm going to, I've got some, some points for REI. I'm going to buy a climbing axe. They said that's the best thing you can do. It's got a little leash, goes around your, your arm. And they said that the real reason you want to make sure you have something to dig into the ground is that the big container ships still go by. Now, do you know what that word big means? Because container ships are like 400 feet long. Like they are massive. Do you know what the word draft means? It means how deep the boat is underwater. And the draft on a container ship is about 40 feet. Maybe 45. Do you remember how deep this river was? Yeah, it's not that different. So you want one of these. So sure enough, we get in the water, and they warn me. They said, hey, you, you'll be able to hear these container ships coming by, so just hang on, pray your guts out, you'll be fine. So all right. I get in the water, and you can't see anything. You can't see your compass. You can't see your light. You can't see the guy next to you. You're just sort of running around, hoping you're going to find gold, immediately feeling foolish. Um, there might have been some hockey talk as I was looking for things and not finding them, but quickly that turned into prayer because I heard, boom, 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 which is the three-story tall propeller of the container ship coming down the river. And so I take my river tool, and I dig into the ground, and I start to pray that the Lord would keep me safe and keep me on the ground. And guess what? He did not. <laughs> And sure enough, the container ship goes by overhead, and it doesn't matter what tool I got. I'm holding on with both hands. My feet are directly up in the air. I look like an acrobat. And now I suppose, because clearly I'm okay, right? I suppose if you could see, if the water was clear, the, the boat probably didn't come anywhere closer than three or four centimeters from lopping <laughs> off my legs. But the point is, I'm, I'm praying good things. I'm prepared. I'm with people who've done this before. I've taken good advice. I've got all the right equipment. I'm doing all the right things. I'm following the right procedures. And I'm saying, Lord, keep me on the ground. And his answer was, (laughs) you're the idiot that climbed in there in the first place. Now this, I I tell you, is, is actually a pretty good example of how we pray most of the time and why we're disappointed most of the time. It's because we pray a prayer. Lord, please help me stick close to the ground so that I won't get hurt. And then something happens in in direct contradiction to the prayer we just prayed. Like hanging upside down, holding on for dear life, simultaneously angry with God, and still begging him to allow you to keep your legs. And I think if we're honest now, at this point, we've got to realize that when we pray, we're not just asking for God to answer. We're asking for the Lord 
to answer our prayers immediately in the precise manner of our petition. And that's different. And when we pray like that, Lord, please help me find a parking space close to the entrance. Lord, please help me to find somebody who's rich, young, and pretty and really wants to marry somebody like me. When we pray those prayers, it betrays some false images in our minds and in our hearts, in our spirits, about God. Uh, there's three false images that I want to draw your attention to tonight. Um, the first is sometimes we think of God like a wizard. We're going to go and see the wizard. We're going to ask the wizard for a magic trick, for a boon, for some help. And the wizard will supply it, and we'll be fine. You've seen this story. You've seen The Wizard of Oz. You've heard all kinds of myths and folklores. And you know how this story usually goes. There's a great sickness in a village. And so the village sends a young hero off to find the wizard. He goes, climbing this mountain, surviving these dangers, arrives at the cave of the wizard and says, please help me rescue everyone in my village. There's a terrible plague killing them all. And the wizard is a disappointment. That's how we often view God. Hey, I showed up here. It's Sunday night on the 4th of July weekend. I'm in a North American sandwich between Canada Day and the 4th of July. Come on. I put down a brat for this. And we pray and we ask God for something and he doesn't, he doesn't immediately heal our village. He doesn't immediately grant our request. He doesn't immediately respond in precisely the way we pray. And we feel mad because he's a crappy wizard. But the problem isn't with God. The problem is with our conception of God. We have looked to him for the wrong thing. And we have looked not even necessarily to him. The second false image that we have is we think of God as our spouse and we imagine that we're in need of couples counseling. Now, I've been doing, uh, performing marriage counseling and couples counseling for probably 20 years and I can tell you, every time a couple that's in distress comes into my office, one of them only wants me to fix the other one. One of them is sitting down going, oh man, finally we got here, so go ahead, tell them what your problem is. I mean, it's that. Every time without exception. And I think sometimes that's how we feel about God. We stand next to the Lord before the world and we look out at all our friends and family and we go, I don't know what his deal is. He never says anything. He won't lift a finger, hardly picks up after himself. It's just me running around taking care of everything. And again, we've totally bought into a lie about who God is and how the nature of our relationship is meant to function. Because God is not the problem. And don't miss this, Jesus is not the one that needs fixing. If there's anything universally true about couples therapy, it's that the other person is not the problem. A third false image that we often buy into about our relationship with God or about who God is and how prayer works is we think that God is sick and old. And in prayer, we imagine that we go to visit him and he's comatose. And so, in our prayer, we stand next to the great God of heaven and earth whose best days are behind him. And we wipe the drool off his chin and we hold his hand and we realize he's here but he's probably not capable of doing much for me anymore. Now the reason I call these false images is because these are the pictures, whether we're willing to admit to it or not, that we have in our mind. These, these are the paradigms that control how we pray and set our expectations for what prayer is supposed to do. Look, I asked you for something, wizard, and you didn't give it. Look, I'm here talking to you, but you're not giving me anything back. I do my part, you're not doing yours. You're beautiful. And I know you rescued the Israelites, but I guess I'll just have to be content. 
What we need when we pray is a new imagination. We need to go back to the scriptures to understand who God is, who we are in relationship to him, and what prayer is supposed to accomplish between us and God. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've given you some good images. We talked about the fact that God is our father, and that in the ancient Near Eastern world of the scriptures, a father primarily raised up his children to be apprentices. God is the householder of planet Earth. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The seas and the fullness thereof. He made everything. He loves everything. He loves everyone. He has created you and I to cooperate with him in his ongoing redemption and creation of the world. He's given us authority to subdue the earth, to fulfill it, and to exercise dominion. That means everywhere you go and everything you do, you are being trained by God to be like God, to look after people, to welcome people, to love people, to be hospitable to people, to heal them, to restore them, to raise them up. That's what your father is teaching you to do through prayer. We've also talked about the fact that prayer is when Jesus mentors us. Because when we think about all the things the Scripture tells us about God, we realize that God is self-sufficient, God is responsible, God is in the business of making and keeping promises and covenants, God is endlessly generative, creative, innovative, working and kind, God is full of peace and love and joy. And so when you spend time with God, that's what he's passing on to you. The fullest, most joyful, most nobly ambitious version of you. And we've talked about the fact that in prayer, God guides us. That the Holy Spirit is our guide on this journey, the journey of life, the journey of relationship, the journey of friendship. It's the Holy Spirit cautioning us about pitfalls in the road, about dangers along the way. It's the Holy Spirit teaching us not only the best way forward, but the most pleasurable and enjoyable way forward so that the journey itself is rewarding, not merely the destination. This is what happens in prayer. But the chief cause of unanswered prayer is prayerlessness. We say we pray, we just don't pray all that much. And so we don't know that we're stuck in these old mental models that frustrate and thwart the purposes of God in us and the ultimate satisfaction and fulfillment of our desires in God. And part of that's cultural. I mean, we live in a really instant society if you like what we're talking about, you can buy our book on Amazon while you're sitting here. If you like what you're hearing, you can share what's happening in church immediately while sitting here. Anytime anybody says anything that resonates with you, you can share it with the whole rest of the universe without effort. And so the problem is, is that we, we face life's difficulties, we face life's challenges, and then we want to sh share it and have it be over with. I shared it, Lord. You didn't see it on my page? Now, I'm a big believer that prayer, that Christian prayer, is like breathing. We are in constant conversation with our God. Our thoughts are prayer. The ambitions of our hearts are prayer. Our songs are prayer. But there are still some times where it's appropriate for us to get down on our knees and bury our face in our hands and call out to the maker and sustainer of worlds. Not for two minutes, but for an extended period of time. Because if these things matter this much to us, we ought to be taking them this frequently and this intensely to him. So as an example, you know, a lot of Sunday mornings, people will come out to me in the lobby after church and they'll say, hey, uh, you know, Pastor Dave, could you pray with me about uh, my finances? We're having kind of a rough time. Of course, absolutely. Of course I will. I think God cares about that. God cares deeply about that. And they'll tell me all the things that have gone wrong. You know, their job is lost, and there's these new bills, and, and I, I get it. Well, the following week, I'll see them. And then almost without fail, they'll run up, hey, thanks so much, really appreciate you praying for me last week. And I know what I'm doing when I ask them, how many hours did you continue to pray about that this week? Now, I'm not trying to embarrass them or shame them, but i got a lot of gray hair, and I've been doing this a long time, so I know what all the lies are going to be if I ask the question a different way. So, like, if I say, have you still been praying about that? They're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. 
And that might not be true until I ask the question, and then they can kind of slip one in mentally. Or even if I say, you know, have you been praying about that daily? They'll go, yeah, for sure, such an important issue. (laughs) And it's not that I want them to feel bad that they haven't prayed. I just want to expose the gap between how much we say this means and the fact that we don't really, with persistence or any passion or any expectation, actually bring our requests to our Father, to our mentor, or to our guide. And nobody's going to give you a grade on how much you pray or how many hours you pray. I mean, I don't care. I'm never going to know. I don't, I'm never going to remember even if you tell me. And you don't need to pray an hour and 45 minutes a day in order to measure up to, you know, the great prayer warriors of Scripture or Christian history and tradition. But if you're in the middle of the suck and your whole life has fallen down around you and you've not even one time spent an hour and 45 minutes in prayer, what are you doing? Because if it matters that much to you, and you think it's supposed to matter to God so much so that you're begging for his involvement in it, why won't you talk to him about it? And again, the point is not for you to feel guilty or weird about the fact that you don't pray enough. None of us pray enough. You're never going to win that game. The point is just like, hey, maybe if it does matter, the appropriate response is to bring it to God in prayer. Knowing he's not going to fix it in the next five seconds, but that still doesn't mean those prayers are wasted, and it still doesn't mean those prayers will go unanswered. You've got to press in. And this brings us full circle. Back to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus, remember, he says, Ask and, and you will receive. Seek and, you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. The problem is, most of our English translations miss what the scripture actually says. Because what the Bible says in both Greek and Aramaic, it's the original language, it says, ask and keep on asking, and you will receive. Seek and keep on seeking, and you're going to find it. Like the parable of the woman and the lost coin. A woman has a treasure, a coin, And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like this woman with this coin. When she loses the coin, she tears apart her whole entire house until she finds it. That's how you pray. You pray and pray and pray and pray and pray until you find what you're looking for. You knock and you keep on knocking until the door is open and Christ comes flooding in a way you never imagined. And many of our earliest Christian mystics in the medieval tradition in particular took the idea that God lives in our heart, that Jesus lives inside of us. And they said, well, if he lives there, maybe he's not the only one. Maybe there's other things that are alive or getting in the way of Jesus and of the light of Christ. Maybe there's your sin, there's your regrets, there's your cynicism, there's your disappointment, there's all your past mistakes, and that forms a kind of bedrock around Jesus. Well, the good news of the gospel of God is that every time you pray, You are excavating the light of Christ deep inside of you. When you pray, you're digging down and down and down into the heart soil where Christ lives. And the reason we don't see him show up more obviously or more frequently is because we take one swick, one swing with our pickaxe and then we're done. We pray one prayer, we don't see the results, and so we fall over and kind of pout about it and then go away. But if you were to ask and keep on asking, if you would seek and keep on seeking, if you would knock and knock and knock and never stop until the door flew open, the light of Christ would blow your face off. That Jesus would come breaking into your life, breaking into your marriage, breaking into your relationships, changing them. Just don't quit, man. Just keep going, keep digging, keep fighting, keep believing because that's the whole purpose of prayer. It's your Father growing you up. It's your mentor refining you. It's your spirit. 